this is the start of a long overdue tutorial on how to use Grin's motor simulator. Now, the motor simulator is a project that I started back in 2004, 2005, when we were getting our first hub motors from China and had scant technical information on their performance. And in fact, the technical information we got was often incorrect. So at the time I built a really crude motor dynamometer in order to actually measure the output torque efficiency and capabilities of these hub motors and parameterize that in a way that we had a very simple model that could help us predict how fast you would go with a given hub motor and what kind of hills you could climb. So since that time we've added hundreds of motors to the catalog of motors that we've characterized and we've continued to add more and more features to this tool to the point that it's now almost overwhelming in its complexity and capabilities. So the goal of this tutorial series is to help show you step by step how to use the simulator both in its basic incarnation and also to dive into the more advanced features that we've added since those days. Now this is a fairly technical tool. If you're simply looking for advice on which hub motor to get and you're not into graphs and data, simply ask our staff for recommendations based on basic information like your weight, the speed you want to go, the kind of hills you have to deal with. There's no need to dive into this level of analysis just to choose a kit. But if you are really trying to understand just how far you can push a system or whether it's capable at a specific scenario, any imaginable question you can ask, the simulation can answer. You just have to understand how to ask that question. So you get to the motor simulator by going to the ebikes.ca website, hitting tools, and then clicking on motor simulator. And what you'll see here are three different broad zones. On the left side is a set of drop-down selector options. So this is where you would choose the type of motor you're simulating, the battery pack you're using, the motor controller. It also lets you set uh, parameters related to the vehicle, like your wheel diameter, how heavy you are, what percent grade hill you're climbing up. In the midsection is the actual output graph. So this is a plot, and it's a plot that shows the vehicle speed on the x-axis, and there's four different lines that it shows as a function of that vehicle speed. Uh, the blue curve here is the output torque of the motor in newton meters. The green curve is the efficiency of the motor. So you can see where the peak efficiency point happens and how that falls off steeply at near, near zero speed. Uh, the red plot is the motor's output power. So this is the power in watts. And the black line, it doesn't relate to the motor at all. This is the load line, and it's how much power is necessary to move the vehicle that you're simulating. So based on the grade hill that you're going and the weight and your aerodynamic drag profile, that will change how many watts you need to move at a given speed. Nominally speaking, the speed that the vehicle will attain is that intersection point where the power output of the motor, the red curve, crosses over with the power needed to move the vehicle, the black curve. Underneath the graph, you see a bunch of numeric data. And this is the data readout at the cursor position of the chart. So as I click on the, the graph and drag it left and right, you can highlight and read out exactly what you see for efficiency, power, motor currents, battery currents, all of those details at a given cursor position. So I think the best way to get started with this is to learn by example. So let's say hypothetically we've decided that we're quite interested in a lightweight geared motor kit for our 700C road bike. And we're not quite sure if it has enough power for a long uh, hill climb that we might have in our commute. Uh, so the kit that we've hypothetically chosen here was a Bafang G310, one of these small geared motors. And we want to go fast. This is a road bike and the person's commuting. Uh, so we've chosen a 52 volt battery as our uh, preferred battery voltage to get to those speeds. Um, this is a kit from Grin, so it's going to come with the base runner controller. And for a worst case simulation, you choose the hot controller. That's when the controller is in thermal rollback and it's not able to put out as much current as it can when it's cold. Now, uh, that's it for selecting the electrical components. We've chosen the motor, the battery, and the controller that we're looking to get. Um, next up, it's very important to model the bicycle that these systems are going on. Uh, in this case, it's a road bike with a 700C wheel. Um, the next drop-down choice here is the sort of aerodynamic and rolling drag profile for that bicycle. Now, if you actually are riding in a road bike in a tuck position, your aerodynamic profile is much less. You're running high pressure tires, so you'll have less power needed to move the vehicle. In practice, on an e-bike, most people don't bother optimizing their ride position that much. So a more realistic position would be, again, in a fully upright riding position. Um, the vehicle weight here is very important when you're simulating with regards to hill climbs. And this is the total weight of yourself plus the weight of the bike plus all the components. So say I weigh 70 kilograms and the bike is 25 kilograms, uh, that would be a total weight of 95 kilos. Um, so you set that parameter to match your weight. Uh, and then the final option related to that is the human power. 
Uh, if you want it to just simulate throttle-only riding, it's important that you set that to zero watts. Otherwise, it's always going to add a human power component to the uh, calculations. Realistically, most people pedal at 75 to 100 watts without issue, and if you're climbing a hill or really putting out, you might be in the 150, 200, even 300 watt range. Uh, so let's say I'm a relatively fit cyclist and I want to ride at 150 watts. Well, now I can just hit simulate, and the graph is dramatically changed to reflect all of these components. So now we see the output curves of this particular set of components. So you can see right away that the cursor has positioned itself at 45 kilometers an hour. Now I said a bit earlier that the bike will reach the speed where the motor power, the red graph, crosses over with the power to move the vehicle, the black graph. But you see that the cursor is actually a little bit beyond this. And that's because the difference in those is equal to our human power of 150 watts. Now if we look down at the bottom where I talked about seeing the numerical data, you can see this. There's 825 watts needed to move the bike at 45 kilometers an hour. The motor is outputting 670 watts, and that difference is the roughly 150 watts of human power. Um, you can see here that the system is predicting that the motor is actually going to overheat. So operating the motor at this voltage and this vehicle speed actually isn't continuously sustainable. So there, even though it's running at a good efficiency, pushing a small motor to these kind of travel speeds is pushing it right up to its thermal limits. You can also see that we're using 18 watt hours per kilometer. So this lets us predict quite accurately what kind of range we're going to get from a given battery pack. So here I've selected a 52 volt, 11 amp, 13 amp hour battery and at 18 watt hours per kilometer that's going to give us a range of just 36 kilometers. But even before we hit that point there's a high likelihood of the motor overheating. So does that mean this is a bad system? Not at all. Uh, if you actually were to ride this at full throttle, once the motor started getting to its thermal rollback temperature set on the cycle analyst, then the power output would reduce and our speed would go down a little bit, but we wouldn't actually overheat the system. We can also see really clearly what simply changing your riding position would do. So at high speeds, aerodynamics is very significant. So if instead of sitting in an upright position, we rode down in a tuck position, well now we see it doesn't even predict any overheating. And this is with mountain bike tires at lower pressure. If we were to go to road bike tires running at a high pressure PSI, you can see that our speed increases even further and our final temperature is even a bit cooler still. Uh, so this will work very great on the flats if you wanted to go at a nice high speed clip uh, with a small lightweight motor. The big question and the main reason you would simulate this is to understand well, what's it going to do when I start hitting hills. So let's just say that you have a 6% grade hill. Now 6% doesn't sound like much, um, that's the kind of hill that when you're riding a normal non-electric bike, you kind of groan a little bit, but it's something you can easily still tackle without necessarily having to get off the saddle. So if I drag that grade up to be a 6% grade hill, well now you see the black line, the power needed to move the vehicle has risen sharply, and that intersection point has shifted to the left to a lower speed when the motor's outputting a higher power. Uh, so now we see 870 watts going to the motor, we need over a thousand watts to move the bike and our speed is slowed down to 39 kilometers an hour. Um, but most concerningly, you can see that the motor is going to overheat in less than 10 minutes. So that is starting from cold motor, if you were to go straight up the 6% hill with 150 watts coming out of your legs, you would have about less than 10 minutes before the motor overheated. Um, now, is that a problem? Well, that really just depends on how long this hill is. If we're moving 40 kilometers an hour, well, in nine minutes, we're going to cover about six kilometers of range. There are very few hills that sustain 6% grade over a six kilometer range. Most hills of that steepness are kind of like a kilometer or two at most, or more realistically, just a few hundred meters. So this might be perfectly fine. You'll be able to climb this hill at a nice fast 40 kilometers an hour, the motor will be hot when you get to the top, but it won't be overheated and have gone into thermal rollback. Now we can see, well, what happens on this hill if you just put in a bit more human power? So let's increase this to 300 watts. Now the rider's pedaling harder, and you can see it still overheats, but it takes more time. It takes 12 minutes, and our speed has increased a little bit as well. So that's an illustration of one of the more practical and frequently used use cases for the motor simulator. Um, it lets you see, for instance, what would happen if you're towing a trailer. So say you have a child in tow uh, with a 5 kilo trailer, the child weighs 10 kilograms, now our weight's 110. And now on that same hill, you can see that we're overheating faster again. 
So notice during all of these simulations that the bike's moving really fast and I'm at 100% throttle the entire time. Now in practice, this is rarely how people ride their e-bikes. Most people these days have a pedal assist system that's always varying the amount of throttle. The most common mistake people make in their first usage of this simulator is to try and understand what happens at lower speeds by just dragging the cursor back. So somebody might say, oh, well, if I climb the hill at 20 kilometers an hour, well, then it's not likely going to overheat. I should get more range. And if they simply drag the cursor here, you'll see it actually overheats faster in five minutes. And our range has gone down to just 15 kilometers. And that's because the simulation is still at a 100% throttle. At 15 kilometers an hour, the motor is outputting more power than we move to move the, need to move the bike, so our speed would increase itself here. To actually simulate climbing this hill at 15 kilometers an hour, we need to reduce the throttle. So the proper way to see what the performance is going to be like at a lower speed is to drop down on the throttle. And as I do this, you can see my speed now simulating to lower and lower speeds. What throttle do I need to get 15 kilometers an hour? Well, you can actually see if I drag the throttle right down to 8%, I'm now climbing this hill at 15 kilometers an hour. And look, the motor barely even gets a degree above ambient. It's 44 degrees. I have a 300 kilometer range. Um, my power consumption is almost negligible, 25 watts coming out of the motor. And that's because at 15 kilometers an hour, my 300 watts of human power alone is responsible for almost all the power needed to climb that hill. The motor's barely doing anything. Uh, let's drop this down to a more realistic value. 100 watts is about what someone could sustain. Well, if I'm just pedaling with 100 watts of power, I can now increase the throttle until I get to a 15 kilometer an hour value. And now you see what would be a much more realistic projection for how the system would perform climbing up a 6% grade hill at 15 kilometers an hour. And here you see the final temperature of the motor is quite hot, not, not technically overheated. Um, and, uh, and you see my range has increased substantially again to 36 kilometers an hour. My efficiency is back up to a reasonable number. And, uh, and this is the expected performance climbing at a lower speed. So if you, were, if you had an indefinite hill to climb, slowing the bike down and climbing at a lower speed will allow you to do that without reaching a thermal rollback on the motor. Now, you see that that's a little bit tedious, constantly dragging the throttle around to see what the performance will be like at steady state for a given speed. So we added one option in the throttle here where you can check auto throttle. And when you check this checkbox, when you click on the cursor, the motor simulator automatically figures out what throttle value will give you the speed that you're looking at simulating at. So with auto throttle enabled, it's much easier to see the performance when you're not riding full throttle and you just want to know at a given speed where you'll be at. Now, if I try to see what my performance would be like at 60 kilometers an hour, of course, it can't simulate that because you'll never have a steady state speed. So it'll clamp you down to the maximum speed that you will attain given these parameters. So that covers the two most basic usage situations here. Understanding how the motor performs with the grade hill and how it performs at different speeds, either by moving the throttle manually or checking the auto throttle when you're clicking on the graph.